Our next topic is ocean habitats, where organisms live. We want to ask what kinds of habitats exist in the world ocean. First of all, a habitat is defined as really just the place where an organism lives. That simple definition belies a complexity, however, in that habitats can be spatial in, in, in origins. In other words, a habitat can be a place, a big place or a little place, some location on Earth. It can also be temporal, meaning a habitat may only exist at a particular point in time. Certain conditions may come about for certain organisms and it's those particular conditions or the existence of those conditions that define the habitat for an organism. A habitat may also include its community, the community of organisms that live around and interact with each other. So a habitat's not only defined in the sort of geologic sense that we think about and not only in the temporal or time sense that we think about, but who's with you also defines a habitat. And that also includes the ecosystem the community of organisms, and the non-living environment with which they interact. Now, in the world ocean, a habitat is kind of a slippery slope in some sense because the ocean is three-dimensional and always in motion for many, at least, uh, waterborne environments. And so it kind of makes us have to think a little bit differently than we normally think of habitats here on Earth. When we think about Earth, we have mountains and valleys and deserts and beaches and, and plains and grasslands and those kinds of things. It's easy to see what kinds of habitats exist in the terrestrial environment. But in the ocean, we have to think about more subtle things like the temperature of the water, the salinity of the water, the presence of light, the pressure, how the water moves, all these different factors that contribute to a place where an organism may or may not be able to live. So the ocean being three-dimensional and, con and constantly in motion makes it a really bit a little different kind of place to think about habitats than our familiar terrestrial world. We also have to consider that most of the ocean is very dark and very cold and under high pressure. In fact, the abyss makes up 90% of all the living space on Earth, including the land, and in some sense is the largest single habitat for life in the universe. Of course, as we'll discover, the abyss is not just a single habitat, but a collection of different habitats based on pressure, temperature, and other kinds of characteristics. So, let's remember, habitats in the ocean, they can be defined in space, so latitude, longitude, and depth, and time whether they occur in a sort of steady state manner or whether they're a more transitional type of conditions that occur in the world ocean. Well, the geological, physical, chemical, and biological factors that determine where and when an organism live determine what are called ocean life zones. The ocean may be sliced vertically, so by different zones of depth, or it may be organized horizontally from latitude, such as temperate or tropical or polar regions. So we have habitats that exist along the surface of the ocean as well as through the depth of the ocean. These vertical layers are called vertical life zones or ocean life zones, and these are the ones that are traditionally found on the internet or in books. Simple regions, horizontal layers, uh, vertical layers, excuse me, um, called ocean life zones. A newer definition is this idea that along horizontal scales from the equator towards the poles, we also have very defined habitats, and those are called biomes. And both of these, both vertical life zones and the horizontal biomes, are important determinants that define the habitats of where marine organisms live, like the ones we just saw. Life zones and biomes are convenient for defining ocean habitats, but in many regards they're probably too general, um, but they do give us some broad brushstrokes by which we can define the kinds of conditions that allow life to exist in the world ocean. Well, here's a figure from the book, and I apologize I didn't put the figure in here, 
But this is the vertical life zones that we find in the world ocean. These life zones are defined by depth and they range from the very surface of the ocean to the various deepest parts of a submarine trench, a topic we talked about in our chapter on plate tectonics, chapter three. We have at the very surface, a misspelled word here, epipelagic, the epipelagic zone, the upper zone. This is also known as the photic zone. So it's the depth of light penetration defines the epipelagic zone. The mesopelagic, sometimes called the twilight zone, because it just has that sort of dusk-like uh, darkness or lightness to it, and it's kind of a scary place in some, in some sense. The bathypelagic, which is below the mesopelagic zone, and which really is uh, a zone that we find final, the sort of final remnants of really abundant life, and then the abyssopelagic, which really is sparsely populated by organisms, uh, and then in the bottom of a submarine trench, we define this zone called the hadopelagic zone, the very deep, deep parts of the world ocean. Now, of course, whether these zones exist is going to depend on the depth. So in coastal regions where it's very shallow, there might only be an epipelagic zone. On the other hand, in uh, the only places where you're going to find the halopelagic zone is where it's very deep, like in submarine trenches. So these zones, again, are the definitions depend on where we're at, and the definitions will also depend on conditions. Of course, the photic zone could be very shallow in a coastal environment that has lots of absorbers and scatterers, but a photic zone might be very deep in a place like the middle of the South Pacific Ocean where there aren't very many absorbers and scatterers and light penetrates very deeply. So again, even within each zone, and even though we tend to assign depths to each of these zones, just keep in mind that these zones may vary uh, depending on location and they may also vary depending on time of year. One other kind of important uh, aspect of this particular figure is what we is we divide up what we call the coastal ocean or the neuritic zone which is a region over the continental shelf a subject we talked about in chapter four when we talked about the seafloor and the open ocean or the oceanic zone the neuritic, neuritic zone or coastal zone is that zone which is influenced by terrestrial processes the ocean zone, the open ocean or oceanic zone, is completely oceanic. Its properties are really defined by the ocean itself. Now, we also have uh, life zones or uh, vertical life zones that are defined for organisms living on the bottom or the benthos. Right below the tide zone, which you may just see offshore and you may even see during low tides part of the zone, but this is called the sublittoral, right below the region between the tides. And it's a very shallow zone, but it, it's also defined by the availability of light, the sublittoral, sometimes also called the subtidal zone. The baffle zone exists down from the, the bottom of the sublittoral zone to the bathypelagic. So the baffle zone for organisms living on the bottom really encompasses in the pelagic world, both the meso and bathic, bathypelagic. So it's this zone where light disappears. Uh, usually we have no um, types of seaweeds or photosynthetic organisms in the baffle zone. And it pretty much ends at this depth here that we'll talk about in just a few minutes. And below that we have the abyssal zone. Again, these are for organisms living on the seafloor. And then in submarine trenches, we have the hadal zones. So we can define vertical life zones in the ocean both by what are called pelagic zones or um, the free water, the, the different zones that we find in the water column, as well as benthic zones, zones defined by depth for the seafloor.